you'd like to join the classes live in the masjid, then click on the link below. Inshallah, it will take you to a telegram group that has the details of all the class timings, the dates, the days, the addresses and the locations of the masjid. So click on that link and hopefully we'll see you there inshallah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go into the name of Allah Azza wa Jal today, Ar-Raziq and Ar-Razaq. Ar-Raziq and Ar-Razaq. These two names, they come in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The name Ar-Razaq is in the Qur'an. The name Ar-Raziq, it comes in the... And the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what does the name mean? What does the name mean? Remember we said Allah Azza wa Jal's names have meanings and they're taken from the characteristic in, they mean, in the meaning. So Ar-Razaq is the one who gives rizq. Okay, what is rizq? What's rizq? Who can tell me what is rizq? <coughs> Sustenance. Okay, what does that even mean? We use English words. But what do these English words mean? Anything that brings you blessing. Anything Anything and everything? Say that again. Give me examples. It's, it's not money, food, wife, spouses. He wants more than one. Huh? Children. What else? Health. What else? Rain. Iman. All of this. Does that make sense? All of this is what? There's all risk. This all risk. We think rizq is just what? Money. It's broader than that. Your house is rizq. Your clothes are rizq. Anything that Allah provides you with, provision, that which He provides you with, sustenance, that which you are sustained through. You see? So, okay, if both names come from that meaning, then what's the difference between the two? Ar-Raziq is the one who provides. Ar-Razaq is the one who's always providing for each and every single thing, without exception. So Ar-Raziq is the one who provides. And Ar-Razaq is the one who's always providing for each and every single thing. So the meaning in Ar-Razaq is more than the meaning in Ar-Raziq. Is that clear? Okay, good. What's the delay that Allah Azza wa Jal provides for everything and everyone? With that exception. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا There is not a moving, living creature on the earth except that Allah gives it rizq. Whatever it might be, whether it be the bird that's flying through the sky or an animal that goes deep inside of the earth to search for rizq, all of them, Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who brings rizq for them. Sometimes we say, no, 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 no. The rizq, it came from nature. Mother Nature brought this to us. وَلِيَادُ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ بِاللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Allah tells us, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ هِي رِزْقَ لَكُمْ He is the one who brought rain down from the sky. It's not the clouds that brought the rain down from the sky. No, the clouds what Allah uses. You know when we look at the water cycle, the water evaporates, it gets into the sky, then it condenses, it forms cloud, when it becomes heavy, then it starts to rain. That's the process. That's the process. But who made that process function? Allah. Who started it off? Allah Azza wa Jal. فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ And then Allah said, Allah is the one who takes the fruits out of the earth when the rain falls. Allah takes the vegetables out of the earth. Me and you don't take it out. Allah takes it out. You say, no, no, no. This is the rain that came down and the seed grew. No. Allah made it happen. Allah made it happen, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't disbelieve in the favors of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah made that happen. The rain can't do that. How many times does rain fall in a place where it should have grown but it didn't grow? How many times do you take medication when you have a sickness and the medication works for this guy but it didn't work for you? How many times do you go to the gym, you are healthy, and you do everything that you should do but you still get diabetes? It's up to Allah. It's up to Allah Azza wa Jal. He does what he wants. Does that make sense? So Allah is in control and He gives the rizq and He gives it to each and every single one. So pay attention. If Allah didn't forget the bird, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لو أنكم, لو أنكم توكلون على الله حق توكله لا رزقكم, لا رزقكم كما يرزق الطير. 
Or كما قال, the Prophet وسلم said, if only you trusted in Allah, the way that the bird trusts in Allah. Every morning it leaves. With an empty stomach, it comes back full. Oh, every morning the bird leaves and it comes out full. Where does, does the bird know where it's going to go to? Does the bird have a job that I can go to and know that at the end of the month it's going to get paid? Does the bird have social security? Does it have soup kitchens? Does, does it know where I'm going to go? It just goes searching. But every day it comes back with risk. Who gave it? Allah. So Allah didn't forget the bird. Allah didn't forget the bacteria that live on the earth. How's Allah going to forget you? But me and you, we forget Allah is in charge. So we try to seek money through haram means. We try to what? Shortcut the process. And Allah has always been in charge of it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We think that we are going to get the risk. Allah said, no. And Allah is upon Allah is to give the risk. You don't. You just, Allah wants you to just go to work, do the efforts. Because that's an act of slavery and servitude to Allah Azza But I'm going to bring the risk. And another verse, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "وَكَأَيِّ مِنْ دَابَةٍ لَا تَحْمِلُ رِزْقَهَا اللَّهُ يَرْزُقُهُ وَإِيَّاكُمْ." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "How many living creatures are there on earth? They cannot carry their own provision. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala provides for that animal, that ant, that fish in the sea, and you." Allah said, "I didn't leave you out. I didn't forget you. I'm providing for all of you." Subhanahu wa Taala. He said that. Does that make sense? And by the way, when Allah gives, He doesn't count. He gives and he gives and he gives without hisab. Allah says, "Wallahu yarzuqu man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab." Allah says, "Wallahu gives risk to whoever He wills without counting." You go to someone to borrow money, counts every penny. Write it down, contract, give him back to him on this date, two days before it's due. He says, "Hey, listen, forty hours. Remember that, brother. Payment's due. Sends your reminder on the day. If you're one minute late, an hour late, boom, sends a message, and you shouldn't be late." If you took a let, you shouldn't be. But people are on it like that. Allah, He gives and He gives. He gives subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he, he provided you with eyes. Did you, did you earn your eyes? When you were born, did you earn your eyes? Did you earn your tongue? Did you earn your nose? Did you earn your mouth? Did you earn any of that? It's a gift from Allah. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has been giving you from day one. Allah has been giving you from day one. Does that make sense? Okay, now once, let's say you're born without eyes. Can you be upset? You, you didn't. You didn't do anything to deserve it in the first place. So if Allah decided to not give it to you, it was not like you had a right to it. Does that make sense? Okay, what about if you lose your eyes 10 years down the line? Still, it was never meant to. Allah took back what was His. Allah took back, subhanahu wa ta'ala, what was His. He gave it out of His bounty. You didn't earn it. You didn't what? Deserve it. But He gave it to you anyway. And He can take it back if He wants. So look at us, subhanAllah, one thing goes wrong in our day and we get so upset. We forget the hundreds and thousands of blessings that we have. وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا ظَلُومٌ كَفَّارٌ Allah said, the amount of blessings Allah has given you are so many, you can't count them. Try. How many blessings do we have? Eyes, ears, mouth, nose, this, that. To a point where things that we don't even take into consideration for example, have you noticed on all of our foot we have a curve? We have an arch. Do you know how important that arch is? Do you know what flat feet is? Someone has flat feet who doesn't have that arch. You know if, they, you know if you've got flat feet, they have problems in their legs, problems in their knees, problems in their back. And some people's feet are so flat that eventually their feet have to get broken and reconstructed. And they may never be able to walk again after that properly. So you didn't even realize there was a little arch on your feet. You probably look at it and think, oh, look at my arch. And even consider it. Does that make sense? But that right there provides a support system for the rest of your body. It's like a spring. And like a spring allows you to, when you bounce up, if your feet's flat, it's always hitting the, the earth. So your knees are coming to contact. The, 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 the contact of the earth is affecting your knees, affecting your foot, it's affecting your hip, it's affecting your back, your whole spinal cord. But that one little curve Allah placed on your foot takes care of all of that. Do we consider that? For example, earwax is a blessing. It captures bacteria that's going inside, that could go inside of you. These are what? Blessings. And if we keep carrying, counting, 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 counting the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal, we'll not be able to stop. But Allah said, insan Allah dhulumun kafar. But the human being will lie. Ungrateful. 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 So Allah Azza wa Jal, He gives and He doesn't count and He's being given. Pay attention, there's no limit to what Allah gives and there's no limit to what Allah has. There's no limit to what Allah gives and there's no limit to what Allah has. So why would you ask anyone else? Okay, pay attention, there are some things that Allah mentions. If you do this, He will give you this. 
For example, if you do what? You pray two rak'ah before Fajr, it's better than the whole world and everything inside of it. If you pray the sunan al rawatib in the day, which is 12 rak'at with your obligatory prayers, you know the sunan, two before Fajr, the four before Dhar, two after Dhar, two after Maghrib and two after Isha, the Prophet said you will get a house in Jannah. Specific deeds bring about specific rewards. Okay? But we know that Allah Azza wa Jal can give and give without counting. So what is a deed that I can do where I don't just get one house? I don't just get one this. I don't just get you know, the world and everything that's in it. No, I'm saying I want reward where I'm just going to get and get and get and get. You know what deed earns that? Sabr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, what does he do? He waffas sabirun bi ghayri hisab. Allah azza wa he gives to the patient ones without counting. As sabr. The king who gives rizq, his rizq has no limit to it. What he has has no limit. And when he gives, there's no limit. He gives without, he gives from his unlimited bounty in an unlimited way to the one who's patient. So if we come with sabr through hard times, calamity, Allah Azza wa Jalla, what? He'll give you and give you, he'll give you. Imam al ajur said, Allah will just pile it on you. It means Allah will pile it on you on the day of judgment without counting. Just give and give and give and give and give, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And give. So be patient, brothers. The opposite of patience is what? Hastiness. Be patient when it comes to calamities. Be patient when it comes be patient when it comes to sins. How do you be patient when it comes to sins? There's a woman that's calling you. Come on, brother. And you have sabr and you say no. Inna lillahi wa inna I fear Allah Azza wa Jalla. Inni akhaf Allah. Okay. And the third type of patience is patience when it comes to obedience. How do you be patient when it comes to obedience? Patience when it comes to obedience, for example, be patient and fast. Be patient, come to the masjid. It requires sabr. What is sabr? To control yourself. Does that make sense? It is through these righteous acts of worship that you... Allah has given rizq anyway. But I'm saying you want more rizq now. Because what Allah gives is a lot, right? But Allah has got more to give. And He can give from that without counting. <laughs> so I want to tap, I want to access that. Sabr. That's how you get it. Tafadl. يوفى الصابرون يوفى الصابرون أجرا بغير حساب بارك الله فيك زخ الله خير بارك الله فيك الله سبحانه وتعالى promised each and every single one of us that the risk he has for us he has it and Allah took a قسم Allah took an oath why, when you say والله why do you say والله why do you say والله is when people are not going to believe you, right? Right? Why do you say wallahi when people are not going to believe you? You say wallahi, it's true. Okay, does Allah have to say wallahi? Does Allah have to swear, take an oath for us to believe him? Because Allah never lies. So if Allah just said it, is what? It's true. But if Allah takes an oath now, it was already true if Allah said it. If Allah swears and says, I swear I have your rizq. That's even more emphasis. Allah says, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِزْقُكُمْ وَمَا تُعَدُونَ فَوَرَبِّ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ And then Allah said, in the sky is your rizq. And Allah said, I take an oath by the Lord of the heavens and the earth. That this is true. So the Imam Hassan al-Basri said, destruction be to the one. Who Allah Azza wa Jal said, I swear I'm going to take care of you. I swear I have your rizq. And he still didn't believe Allah. How did he not believe Allah? Because he went and earned money in a haram way. He went and earned that rizq in a haram way. He compromised his deen for that rizq. He shaved his beard for that job. She took off her hijab for that job. Compromised the deen. They said, you know what? I hear you, Allah provides. But I've got family to feed. Ittaqillah, man. You don't feed no one. You don't feed yourself. Understand who you are, human. Oh, human, understand who you are. You don't feed yourself. Allah feeds you, man. He's been feeding you. Nowadays, parents, they commit sins to put food on the plate for their kids. 
Who was feeding your son when he was inside of the belly of your inside of the womb of your wife? Who provided for the child then? Who provided? Who provided the nourishment inside of the womb? Was it you? Then when the baby was born, who put the milk inside the breast of your wife? Who did that? And you, who thinks that you have to go and earn her more money? So you can what? Put food in your plate. Allah's been taking care of you. And the audacity you have to say, you know what? I need to go out there and get it myself. No! Ibn Qayyim said, when you were inside of your mother's womb, there was one thing Allah did to provide for you, through, your umbil- through the, mo- your, the mother's umbilical cord. When you were born, he doubled it, and he gave you the two breasts of your mum, which had milk inside of there. And then when you grow older, he doubled it. And he made it two solids and two liquids, four things. The water that you, that, that you drink from and the milk, which is the two liquids, and the two solids is the vegetables that you eat and the meat. And if you worship Allah in obedience upon that, Allah will double those four and make it the eight gates of Jannah for you to walk through. But you still don't believe him. Allah has been in charge, brothers. Don't ever for yourself, for a second, think to yourself that you're in charge. You'll start to go and that's when you fall into sin. Even if you don't fall into sin, even if you fall into arrogance, look, I did it myself. If it was halal, or you're going to say, I need to find a haram means to go and find it. Allah took an oath. He swore. He didn't just swear by anything, he swore by himself. I'm going to take care of you. So he's going to take care of you. Do you understand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to <coughs> take care of you. There are two reasons in the Quran why Allah Azza wa reminds us that he gave us rizq. Two reasons. Where he reminds us that he gave us rizq, that he provided for us. The first reason is so you can know that Allah was good to you. You can know that Allah was good to you. You can know how generous he was to you. Why, why is that important? Because when you know someone's generous, what do you do? You love them. Why do you love your mom? Because she's done more for you than anyone else, right? So Allah says, Hal jaza'u ihsani illa ihsan. Is there any reward for good other than good? If a person treats you good, it's not for you to disrespect them back. If a person does good to you, you do good back naturally. You love them. So Allah tells you the things that He done for you. So that what? You can appreciate. And you can be grateful and you can love Him back. And the second reason why Allah tells you about the blessings. So you can know because he gave you this Don't worship anyone else except for him Only worship him So what are the two reasons? So you can acknowledge the blessing and be grateful And love him The second reason is so you can know That no one else can give me this So no one else has the right to deserve to be worshipped Did the Prophet ﷺ put food in your plate? So you don't worship the Prophet ﷺ Did Jesus put food in your plate? No, Jesus had food put on his own plate Jesus was inside of his mum Doing what? Benefiting from the umbilical cord. Then when he came out, he took, he drank from her breast. May Allah have, uh, be, uh, have uh, mercy on him. And uh, we ask Allah to send his salam. Alayhi salam upon Isa alayhi salam. So look at these kuffar, the way they worship other than Allah. And there are people, what they worship the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Or they worship the saints. Or they worship what? The imams. They worship Ahl Bayt. Some of them, they worship themselves. They worship what? Themselves. And none of them provided. So let's go through each one in detail, inshallah ta'ala. Let's take some examples of Allah Azza wa Jal reminding us He provides so that we can appreciate it and love Him. And let's take examples of Allah Azza wa Jal reminding us He provides so that we know He deserves to be worshipped. The first one, examples of Allah Azza wa Jal providing so we can be grateful. Allah said, Wallahu ja'ala lakum min anfusikum azwajan. Wa ja'ala lakum min azwajikum. عفوا الله سبحانه والله جعل لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا وجعل لكم من من أزواجكم بنينا عفوا بنينا وحفدة ورزقكم من الطيبات أف بالباطل يؤمنون وبنعمة الله هم يكفرون الله سبحانه وتعالى said, Allah is the one who gave you wives Allah is the one who is the one who what He made for you sons He made for you children he made for you grandchildren and he bestowed his good provision on you then Allah سبحانه وتعالى said, أف بالباطل يؤمنون then are they going to believe in false gods? Are you going to worship false gods? And are they going to disbelieve in the favor of Allah? The good that Allah has done? Allah, you, you, you wanted to get married. So Allah got you married. Once you get married, what do you do? What do you do? You forget about the rights of Allah. Person, this is something that I find quite disgusting in brothers. They start practicing and they come to the masjid up until the point they get married. One day they get married, 
I said, they're on their dean, they pray five times a day, but their objective in life is just to get married. That's it. He just stops studying, stops coming to Duru's, stop, just stops everything. Now, his life just revolves around his wife. Allah, Allah is the one who brought you this wife. Then he brought you the children. So show some shukr to Allah. That's the uh, characteristic of the hypocrites. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When they were told to go out and do jihad, they came to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we got busy with our family and our children, with our wives, kids, and our wealth, our money. Like how we say today, I was busy with family, I was busy with work. How many times do I come to people? For example, after Jum'ah today, I must have spoken to so many brothers. I said, we've got classes in the masjid, this, that, come tonight. And they say, what? Yeah, I know I've got exams. Yeah, I know I've got this. Don't have much time. I said, well, this is excuse of the hypocrites. You're telling me you can't give your king an hour, an hour, less than an hour in a week to come and learn about him? Okay, you're learning somewhere else good. If you're not, then come, local. Especially if we live local. One of the sickest things personally to hear I'll be honest with you, it's very disgusting to hear. People say, Akhi, Wallah, it's far, you know. I come from East London. Wallah, if someone said to you right now, you're going to travel every single day. You're going to travel every single day at this particular time, and you're not going to be late. And you're going to do it for 10 years, and I'll give you a billion pounds. Wallah, he would do it. There's nothing greater than knowing Allah, because through knowing Allah, you will get benefit in this life and the next. You'll have the highest rank in this life and you have the highest rank in the left. Uh, sorry, in the next. But we'll say, ah, oh, well, I still you know, I've got work, you know. We'll come to the mission late, we'll come to the lesson late. When it comes to learning about Allah, late. When it comes to working for that kafir Bob, that shaitan who's going to burn in hell perhaps. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rachel, I'm sorry I was late. I'm so sorry. Disciplinary, Muhammad. We're going to give a disciplinary after check. Well, I'm so, I, I would never do it again. But masjid, well, I will come in late to the circle of knowledge. To learn about Allah to learn about his deen. We say, I'm sorry, I'm busy with work, I'm busy with family. Alhamdulillah, if you come, you come late, it's better than the one who doesn't even come. I'm busy with work, busy with family. Who gave you that family, man? Who gave you that work, man? Allah says, Yaquluna bi afwahihim. They say, that's not Ali Imran, right? Yaquluna bi alsinatim. They say with their tongues, ma laysa fi qulubin, that which is not inside of their hearts. No, he's just saying my family made me busy. He has no desire to come and learn about the deen. He has no desire to go in the path of Allah. He's got no desire to put the work in for the sake of Allah. Does that make sense? So Allah said, Allah gave you all of this. Be grateful. The second thing Allah said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَرِ وَرَزَقَنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and indeed we've honored the children of Adam. How did Allah honor you? How did Allah honor the children of Adam? Number one, he gave you aql. The rest of the animals have aql. The rest of animals don't have aql, they just have desire. So when you have desire, you sleep with whoever, you kill whoever, you eat whoever, you get killed, you don't realize it. Your desire runs, we have aql. Allah gave us this. Does that make sense? So he honored us in that. Number two, do we wear clothes? Do any of the animal, other animals wear clothes? Do any of the other animals wear clothes? Their fur, is it clothes? No, they're just hairy. Some brothers here, they're hairy too. Ask them to take off their top, you think, silverback gorilla. <laughs> Allah Mabarik, mashallah, from the jungle. You know what I'm saying? It's us Asian brothers, left have to keep it real. <laughs> I've noticed that, uh, you know, Asians here, we're like third, fourth generation. I noticed the weather here affected the, the, the Pakistani kids that are born in the third, fourth generation. They don't have much hair. Their genes are weak. You have to come eat some curry, inshallah. Maybe that might have an effect. The point is that Allah, honored, that Allah honored us, He gave us clothes. The animals don't have clothes. They're naked. And look at, look at that, they're naked. No, they, it's just... Allah honored you, give you clothes, jackets, shoes, all of this. No clothing is such a blessing. Allah said, Ya Bani Adam, Qad anzalna alaykum libasan. Allah said, O children of Adam, we sent down to you clothes. Pay attention, when Allah talks about things that He sent down, it's very big things. When Allah says, I sent something down, it's very big things, things that you need. For example, Allah said, we sent down rain. Is rain something small? Water is the essence of life. Allah sends down the Qur'an. Allah sent down clothes. Big thing, Allah. Why? You wear so atikum barisha, so you can cover your private part, man. Cover that filthy private part. Pay attention, the word private part is the same word Allah used to describe a dead corpse, a dead body. When Adam's son killed his other son, 
Allah referred to his what? His dead body in that same way. So a person's nakedness is used, Allah used that same word of being naked to describe a dead body. It's filthy. We don't want to see your, we don't want to see your nakedness. That's just for you and your wife or your husband and the, the woman's husband and, and, and whatnot. Does that make sense? But to put it out and display it in the public is dirty. It's dirty. So imagine Allah gives you clothes and now what? We take it off. We're not grateful. Allah gives you clothes and you say, I'm going to wear the clothes in disobedience. Allah, I'm going to wear my trousers below my ankles. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whatever is below the ankles is inside of the hellfire. And then what, whatever is below the ankle is inside of the hellfire. And we say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to wear my I'm gonna wear it. I want to wear it. The woman says, I'm going to wear what? These clothes that Allah gave me. I'm going to wear them outside in a filthy way. I'm not going to cover them with tight clothes. The blessing Allah gave, we use it in a bad way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And we what? We carried them on land and sea. All of this that you have, the horses that we used to ride, the cars that we know drive, the ships that we have, planes that we can fly with. Imagine within six hours you could be on the other side of the earth. Six hours. That's gratitude, wallahi. So shukr to Allah, man. Does that make sense? Allah says, وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقَنَا تَفْضِيلًا And we preferred the human. We preferred him above many of the other creations that we had, that we had given preference to. Allah, gave, Allah picked you out to the point where Allah made all of these angels make sujood to you, to, to your father. To your father Adam, Allah made all the angels do sujood to him. Iblis refused, and because his refusal and his arrogance, Allah Azza wa threw him outside of paradise, out of honor for the human being. But we don't honor Allah Azza wa Jal. Does that make sense? This earth Allah gave us is rizq. Allah said, Allahu alladhi ja'ala Allahu alladhi Allahu alladhi ja'ala lakum al-arda qararan wa samaa binaan wa sawwarakum fa ahsana suwarakum wa razaqakum min al-tayyibat thalikum Allahu rabbukum fa tabaraka Allahu rabbul alameen Allah is the one who made the earth a dwelling place for you. The earth is still it's flat. I know it's not flat from in terms of the planet but in terms of the way it is for us it's flat, you can build on it, you can drive on it. Imagine the earth was mountainous. Imagine it was all mountainous. Imagine it was all what crooks and crannies, you wouldn't be able to build anything. You wouldn't be able to build, you wouldn't be able to live. You wouldn't be able to travel. Imagine traveling through mountains, imagine the whole world was just mountains. Imagine the whole world was rocky. No, Allah, these are things that we take for granted. These are blessings that we couldn't live on the earth if Allah didn't make it the way it is. Does that make sense? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, wa sawwarakum fa ahsana suwarakum. Allah, He beautified you. He made you in the best of forms. Look at the way you, Allah made you all beautiful. Do you not see how we look different to the animal kingdom? We look so different. Yeah, they are kufar. They say, no, we had to come from that monkey right there. That monkey right there. So they, they now, they're saying things like, we've got the same DNA as bananas. they say saying our DNA and the bananas DNA, very similar. I say, you, my friend, are an idiot. <laughs> Your banana, yeah? <laughs> Nowadays, the world is like that. Have you seen that brother who said he's Korean? But he's from the UK. Have you seen it? He said, I'm a Korean pop star. But he's from the UK. They call it transnationalism. It's transgender, now it's transnational. People funny, huh? Okay, so then these are the reasons Allah tells us He blessed us so that we can know He was good to us. So we can be good back to him. The second reason Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us his blessings is what? So we can what? We can know that he deserves to be worshipped alone. Allah told us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nasu abudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum wa alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun alladhi ja'ala lakum al-arda firashan wa al-samaa bina'an wa anzala min al-samaa ima'an fa akhraja bihi min al-thamarati al-izqal lakum. Allah said Allah is the one who created you, he created your forefathers, your parents, your parents, parents, all the way back. And then what he sent down, what? He created the earth for you, he sent rain down from the sky for you, he brought vegetation out. He did all of this, he created this universe for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَا تَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادٍ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ So if you know Allah did all of this for you, why do you worship someone else besides him? Why don't you worship him? You say, no, I don't worship Hanuman monkey or Ganesh the elephant. I don't worship. I don't. But you worship yourself though. Don't forget that you worship yourself. Allah said, Have you not seen the one who took his desires as a God? 
Right? There's levels to this, my brothers and my, uh, and my sisters. Well, I, we don't realize how deep it goes, this concept of self-worship or the worship of other human beings. I'll give an example. Now, I'm not trying to say that a person who does this fell into shit, but I'm trying to show you how deep the issue of Tawheed goes. If a person praises you and he's a celebrity, a big celebrity, for example, yeah? Or like a king of a country, how happy would you be? You'd be so happy you may not even be able to go to sleep at night because of how happy you are. But then the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah Azza wa Jalla said, What? If the slave remembers me to himself, the kartu fi nafsi, I remember him to myself. And if he remembers me in a gathering, I remember him in a gathering which is greater. If you just say SubhanAllah, Allah just made mention of you. You, mean, you mentioned Allah, right? So Allah mentioned you. We're here in a gathering mentioning Allah. Allah is going to mention us, inshallah. It's a hadith that mentions it. So when you come to the masjid and you study the Quran, or you recite the Quran, and we're studying the Quran right now, the four things happen. Allah's mercy envelops us. Allah's peace and blessings come above us. The angels, they spread their wings around us. Allah, he mentions you by name to the angels that are with him. To the point where there's another narration that mentions that everyone who comes to the gathering is forgiven. To the point where what? Some of the angels say, but Ya, Rasul, ya, ya Allah, there's a person who didn't even come for the lesson. He was coming for some other reason, he just happened to be there. Allah says, there's no one who comes to this gathering except that he's forgiven. Now do you see why it's so annoying when, for example, you come to, the to this gathering but you come late? Or you come to the gathering and you don't sit attentively. We come to the gathering, we have our feet stretched out. You know, these things are very bad manners. The ulama, they would say, for example, Shaykh Salih he said that your knowledge will be cut from you in the lesson as much as you stretch out your leg. Some of the ulama would not even point their feet towards their teacher's houses. Forget in front of him in the lesson. Towards what? His house. Why? Not because he's something special, but because he's carrying the sunnah. He's carrying the deen. He teaches me the deen. Does that make sense? So we come late, and it's like this is a gathering where you can earn forgiveness from Allah. It's a gathering where Allah is going to mention you. And you know what's sad? Is that despite you coming late, and despite what you being distracted, in and out, on your phone, this, that, losing focus, Allah is still going to mention you, inshaAllah. You couldn't even focus, but Allah is still going to mention you. Look at the mercy of your Lord. It should make you feel shy, man. It makes you make, you feel, make us feel embarrassed, man. It makes us want to go harder, work harder. Does that make sense? It should make us want to work harder. So because of all of these reasons, so, so the point I was making was that, look, Allah mentions you and you don't get excited. But a kafir mentions you, and, oh, we got excited. A, uh, someone, an influencer sends you a DM or praise your story, excited. But Allah Azza wa Jal sent you a message as well, the Qur'an. It was a message directly sent from Allah Azza wa Jal to you. And you know what? It's there. It's there on the top of your shelf. You haven't opened it for a long time. You didn't want to learn the meaning of it. Imagine, for example, you got a DM from Khabib. And you know, on his Instagram, he types in Russian, right? So you're like, brother, I don't understand this. What is he talking? He's talking some Russian. Well, nah, you'll find translation for that. You'll go, you'll find a Russian brother. You'll find some Russian brother, you say, I do tafsir of this, sharh, tell me everything. Tell me the different, tell me, tell me the different, you know, do i'rab of this for me. Where's the raf, where's the marfu, where's the, where's the mansu, where is it? Is this mu'ram, is it mabni? I want to know, is this jamma taksir? Is it mabnu min al what is it? Tell me what it means. You frame it, put it up. Quran, well, I just there, forgotten about. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complain on the, on the Day of Judgment. Say, Allah, my ummah, they abandoned the Quran. They have what? Abandoned the Qur'an. So this shows the problem inside of us. We worship others. Maybe not entirely, but that concept of, not worship maybe, but valuing or venerating or honouring others more than we should really be venerating or honouring Allah Azza wa Jal. Not saying a person becomes a mushrik, but definitely it's disgusting. It's a disgusting characteristic. So the next verse is Allah Azza wa Jal said, Allah, Allah alladhi khalaqakum thumma razaqakum thumma yumitukum thumma yuhyikum هَلْ مِنْ شُرَكَائِكُمْ مَنْ يَفْعَلُ مِنْ ذَلِكُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ Allah is the one who gave you food. Allah is the one who provided for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will cause you to die. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you life again. 
The things that you worship besides Allah, the things that you call upon besides Allah, can they do any of that? Can they give you food? Can they take your life? Can they bring your life back to death? Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yushrikun. Glory be to Allah Azza wa Jalla above all of the shirk that they do. So because Allah does these things, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does these things, He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be the first one that we wake up for in the morning. He deserves for us to wake up before we wake up for Fajr to pray with Him on the last third of the night. But all of us, all of us at the time, why are too busy sleeping? Except for those who Allah has mercy on. All of us put Allah Azza wa Jalla last. All of us, all of us don't give Allah Azza wa Jalla his rights. My brothers, well, they are angels that Allah has created that have never, ever lifted their head. They've been in sujood from the moment Allah created them. And on the day of judgment, the first time they will lift their head. And when they look at the glory of Allah Azza wa Jalla, they will say, Allah, we did not worship you the way that you deserve to be worshipped. The greatness of your Lord. And then what about us? What about us? Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to take some lessons quickly from a man called Qarun. Qarun was a man who was very rich at the time of Musa alayhi salam. Allah had given him a lot of wealth. Allah had given him a lot of wealth, okay? And sometimes Allah gives you rizq. And you, we behave the way Qarun behaved. And because Qarun didn't appreciate the rizq Allah gave to him, he became arrogant. Allah Azza wa Jal gave him a destructive punishment. So we're going to quickly go through this inshallah ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ قَارُونَ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمِ مُوسَى فَبَغَى عَلَيْهِمْ Qarun was a man from the people of Musa alayhi salam, and he was a tyrant. وَأَتَيْنَهُ مِنَ الْكُنُوزِ مَا إِنَّ مَفَاتِحَهُ The treasures Allah gave him were so big that the key to these treasures would have to be carried by a group of strong men. Pay attention. It's not that his treasures were big. His treasures were so big that the key to unlock his treasure was so big that a bunch of men would have to pick up the key, let alone the treasure itself. Does that make sense? So the people gave him some advice because of all this money that he had. The first advice that they gave him, they said, don't be ungrateful. If قَالَ لَهُ قَوْمُهُ لَا تَفْرَحْ People said, listen, don't be too excited. Don't be too glad. Does that make sense? In Allah you hib. In Allah la yuhibbu al-farihin. Don't become so excited that you become ungrateful thinking that this is just you. Allah doesn't like people like that. Does that make sense? The next thing that they said is they said, seek the akhirah. Wabtaghi fi ma ataak Allah ad-dar al-akhirah. They said, seek the akhirah through what Allah has given you. Allah gave you wealth, right? So then seek the akhirah through it. How do you seek the akhirah through the wealth? Sadaqa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu, anfiqu mimma razaqnakum min qabli ay yatiya yawmun la bay'un fihi wa la khulla. Wa la khullatun wa la shafa'ah. Allah said, give from the rizq Allah has given you. Sprint from what Allah has given you before a day comes. On that day, there is no business transaction. That's good. Like for example, today you can buy yourself out of a mess. You get arrested, you can get bail money. Okay, you got a problem, you could do this, you could do that. Sometimes you can even, astaghfirullah al azim it's haram, but you can bribe a judge, you can bribe a, an, an MP or someone. Does that make sense? And get out of a hot mess. But on that day, you just, money is not going to do anything for you. Your money will do something for you today. So spend it. Spend sadaqah for the sake of Allah. Does that make sense? So through what Allah has given you, seek the akhirah. Does that make sense? Wala tansa nasiba kamil al dunya. But look what they said. They said, and don't forget your portion of this world. As in, we're not saying just completely turn to the akhirah and forget about the dunya. No, we're saying, don't take what you need from this life. Take what you need from this life. Imam Qurtubi in his kitab al said, you know what it means, take, don't forget your portion of this world? Some people think it means, you know, you, know, you see a guy, he's mashing out, got cars, clothes, nice house. I'm not saying anything, these, these things are wrong. But you tell him, Akhi, kind of be, maybe take it easy. He says, لا تنسى نصيبك من الدنيا. He said, لا تنسى نصيبك من الدنيا. Don't forget your portion of this world. That's what Allah said. But that's not how all the scholars understood it. Imam Qurtubi said it means, or he said some of the scholars said it means, don't forget the white cloth that you're going to be buried with. Because that's the only portion of this world that you take into your grave. The only thing that you take into your grave is what? The white cloth you're going to be buried. So the portion of this world, don't forget, meaning have enough money that when you die, there's a white sheet that's made from halal money that you can be wrapped up in and buried in. 
Imagine a person where he's going to be buried and is made out of haram. Imagine the funeral cost that they spend is out of haram money. Riba, mortgages, loans, selling drugs, alcohol, fraud, this, that, treachery, deception. And he's buried with that. He's in his grave now. That's the, that's the, the only thing, the only thing you're going to take from this world. Imagine a person, like he lived and he died. He lived and he died. He bought cars, he bought houses. He did so much. He had the nicest crepes, everything. Everything except a white cloth to be buried in. As a hadith in Sunnah Tirmidhi, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the thing that you're going to be buried in, he said, beautify it. How do you beautify the clothing that you're going to be buried in? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, that what you do is have an item of clothing that you do a lot of good deeds in. So the scholars explained it and they said it means have an item of clothing that you do a lot of good deeds in. Have an item of clothing that you pray salah in. Have an item of clothing that you give, you seek knowledge in. Have an item of clothing that what? You give sadaqah in. Have an item of clothing that you enjoy in a good for the even. Have this item of clothing throughout your whole life that you did a lot of khayrin. And have it in your will that you want this to be, you want to be buried with this. You want this to be your kafin. You want this to be your shaw. Does that make sense? So he worked on everything. Except for the one thing he was going to take into the next life with him. So let us and Asiba come in the dunya. Yes, don't forget your portion of life. Get married, have house, cars, clothes, enjoy yourself. Or as Imam Qurtubi said, it means... Don't forget the way what you're going to take into the next life with you. Does that make sense? وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ And then look at the advice they said. They say, be good as Allah was good to you. Wallahi, Allah has been good to all of us. Qarun had rich riches. Some people have got billions. Wallahi, we're all billionaires. What's the proof of that? If I said to you, give me your organs. Give me your heart. Give me your brain. And I'll in return give you a hundred billion pounds. Is anyone going to give me their brain for 100 billion pounds? What if I say a trillion pound? What if I say to you, listen, I'm going to give you the whole value of the cryptocurrency market. The crypto market value. I'm going to give you the whole value right now. Give me your brain. No. Why? It's priceless. What use is the money when you don't have a brain? You're not alive no more. So that's the same for your heart. That's the same for your kidneys. That's the same for what? All the things that Allah gave you. So we're all billionaires. We're what? More than billionaires. So Allah has been so good to us, man. Allah has been so good. So wa ahsin kama ahsin Allah ilayk. Be good the way Allah has been good to you. So be good to Allah first. Be good to the people. Be good to your neighbors. Be good to the believers. Does that make sense? Don't sp- people get money and what? They spend their money on evil. And that brings us to the last thing. They said, وَلَا تَبَغِ الْفَسَادَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And do not make mischief on the land. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُفْسِدِينَ Allah doesn't like those who make mischief. Pay attention. The ones who make money, what do they do? They, what do they do? They create mischief on the land. People who make money, they bring drugs. People who make money, they bring what? They have parties, clubs, this, that. Some countries, Allah blesses them with rizq in abundance. Allah may give them natural resources. He may give them diamonds. He may give them gold. He may give them oil. And how do they show gratitude? By spreading facade, opening nightclubs. Opening nightclubs and having free mixing and alcohol in their lands. People who have money, they do what? They do mischief. Don't use your money for mischief. Allah doesn't like those who what? You do this. A man gets rich, what does he do? Goes to the club, buys bottles of expensive alcohol, spends it money on what? Women, prostitutes, hotels. Fasad. Fasad. Does that make sense? What was his response? He said, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي He said, this was given to me, all this wealth that you are telling me what to do with it. You're telling me be good and this and that and not create mischief. All of this was given because of knowledge I possess. What he's trying to say is, I earned it. He's trying to say, this, this, this money right here, I earned it myself. Does that make sense? Well, many Muslims behave like this. They say, I made this. I earned this. I built this. 
I'll work my whole life for this. Same thing. This is one of the most evil and disgusting things that you can say in response to the favors that Allah will give you. So what's his punishment? The earth swallowed him. And he's going to be falling to the day of judgment. He's still falling right now. The earth swallowed him. And he's still falling until the day of judgment. So be grateful for all that Allah has given you. Now because Allah is the one, we're moving on to the next section now. Because Allah is the one who gave us rizq. Because he's the one who gave us rizq, he's the one who tells us what to do with it. Because he gave it to us, he tells us what to do with it. So some of the things that Allah tells you, number one, he tells you, spend it. Give sadaqah, give charity. If you're a man, provide for your household. Does that make sense? If you see someone poor, you see an orphan, you see, spend your money. يَا أَيُّوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ يَوْمٌ لَا بَيْعٌ فِيهِ وَلَا خُلَّةٌ وَلَا شَفَاعَةٌ وَالْكَافِرُونَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Allah said, O you who have believed, spend from that which we have provided for you before the day comes. This day, there is no exchange, there is no friendship, there is no intercession. No friend is going to help you, no money is going to get you out. No one is going to intercede for you, does that make sense? But if you spent before that day, you spent your money before that day, then inshallah ta'ala will help you. And Allah said, spend from what I gave you, it's Allah's. You're a caretaker with that money, with that rizq that Allah Azza gave you. Does that make sense? You're a caretaker, so spend it. Also, you have strength Allah gave you. Use your strength in the, for the sake of Allah Azza Allah gave you something. Use your, the blessing Allah gave you for the sake of Allah Azza The second thing Allah tells us to do is to be grateful. Allah says, Ya ayyu al-ladhina amanu, kulu minat tayyibati ma rizqanakum, wa shkuru lillahi in kuntum iyahu ta'budun. O you who believe, eat from the good that Allah has provided for you and be grateful. Be grateful. How do you be grateful? Is it just something you say? It's something that you do and you say. What's the evidence? Allah said, I'malu ala Dawood shukra. O family of Dawood, Allah told them to do shukr. He didn't say, say shukr. He said, do it. Doing it is an action. I'malu, action, act, the shukr. So shukr you can do with your heart, with your tongue, with your actions. So for example, if Allah gave you knowledge, you're spreading that knowledge is shukr. If Allah gave you a blessing, you're spending that blessing in the path of Allah is shukr. Brothers, if you want to be grateful, you want to do shukr, you need to do four things. The first thing is al-i'tiraf bin ni'ma. You have to acknowledge the blessing. The first stage of shukr is to acknowledge the blessing. If you didn't even acknowledge the blessing, well, it's very sad that you see people, they say, my life is rubbish, my life is dead, life is so hard. Blessings are all around them. They don't even acknowledge it. The first thing is wake up and smell the coffee. Acknowledge the blessing. The second thing is Al-I'tiraf bil mun'im Acknowledge the one who gave you the blessing Allah Don't acknowledge your wife Don't acknowledge your parents As the one who gave you the blessing They might have been a means to bring the blessing to you So acknowledge them as a means But not as a source Allah is the source of all the blessings Acknowledge The third thing is Al-I'tiraf To acknowledge The means Allah used to bring the blessing to you For example Why are you good to your parents? <coughs> because they are the means by which Allah brought you into this world Life is a blessing The one who gave you life is Allah He gave it to you through mom and dad So now be good to them You got money That's the blessing Allah is the one who brought it to you A brother helped you get the job to get the money Acknowledge the means Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said La yashkurullah The person will not be grateful to Allah The one who has not been grateful to the people Or kama qal the one who's not been grateful for the people, to the people, he's not grateful to Allah. But when you're thanking the human, you're not thanking him as a source, you're thanking him as the means Allah used for Allah to bring that blessing. The fourth thing is that you use that blessing in the obedience of Allah. Allah gave you hands and you oppress people with it. Allah gave you eyes and you what? You watch filthy things with it. Allah gave you ears, you listen to music with it. Allah gave you tongue, you backbite with it. Allah gave you good brothers. What do you do? You backstab them. You use the blessings Allah gave you for what? For obedience, not for disobedience. That was the second thing Allah commanded us to do with regards to the rizq He gave us. The third thing Allah told us to do is not to kill our children out of poverty, out of fear that they will not be provided for. Today we call this what? We call it abortion. Allah said, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ وَلَا تَقْتَلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ خَشَّةَ إِمْلَاقٍ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُهُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ Allah said, and do not kill your children out of fear of poverty. We will provide for them and you. 
Again, the person gets an abortion. We can't have this child. We're not going to be able to provide for this child. Let's get an abortion. It was not you that was going to provide in the first place. It was Allah. We already established earlier, right? Allah is the one who provides. So have children. Have children. Have them open the doors for children. Don't be selfish. Well, like one of the most stingy things is to say, I want only one or two children. Child. The Prophet ﷺ said, marry women who are what? Tazawwajul walud al wadud. Or come on, marry women who are very loving and who want to have children. Why? Because the Prophet wants to have the greatest ummah on the Day of Judgment. <coughs> so you need to come with children. Nowadays, what? Two, three, four, five. A brother, how many people do you know that have got eight, nine kids? Are they broke? Is there, do, do you know them broke? Do, do, they, do they not always have food on the table? Okay, it doesn't mean that you can't work, you can't maybe plan a little bit, wait a little bit. Does that make sense? But sometimes we're going to too much extreme with this waiting because we're really relying on ourselves. Go and have that child. Omar. Go have that child. <laughs> <laughs> what age do you want to be when you have a child, Omar, inshallah? Maybe 25. Billah. 25. <laughs> <laughs> the legal age in this country to get married is 18. Nine months after your wedding. I want to see good news. <laughs> yeah? What would you name your first child? Think just quickly, pick a name. Um, would you like a boy first or a girl first? A boy first. A boy first. What would you like to call him? Um, Abdullah. Huh? Abdullah. Abdullah. Abu Abdullah is your name from now, inshallah. Abu Abdullah. That's what we're going to call you. Abu Abdullah. You like that, huh? The father of Abdullah. All these brothers are going to be at your wedding, inshallah. Nine months, they're going to be waiting. N nine months after the first, they're going to say, Ak, what's going on? <laughs> Do you understand? Allah mubarak. Say Allah mubarak, guys. So don't kill your children off. Does that make sense? Allah, and then Allah Azza wa Jal told you, stay in a state of taqwa. Stay in a state of taqwa. Why Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجَعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever fears Allah, who has taqwa, who fears Allah, who obeys Allah and fears Him, Allah will find a way out for him. And Allah will give him rizq from places he never imagined. You have a question, Akhi? What does acknowledge constitute? Say again? What does acknowledging the blessing and the means of Allah not constitute? Is it thanking them, trying to return? Like, what does it constitute? Even to say thank you. Or being good to them, and, but to, to acknowledge it. No. So to, to acknowledge it. So if you it's acknowledge it in your heart, you need to say thank you. But you should say thank you to them. Yeah, you should show them gratitude, appreciation. Yeah. You should do that. Being good to someone is acknowledging and appreciating, you know? Letting them know, thank you. <clears throat> Definitely not to do the opposite. Well, like, some people are so bad. Some people are good to them. Well, like, well, like, I've seen this throughout my life. And I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I really hope that if I'm good to someone, it's for the sake of Allah. Because I've been, in, I've been good to enough people to see them violate me in, the, in, in, in return or as the years pass. So if it was for the people, I really think I would stop. So I'd like to believe that's from Allah Azza wa Jal. I've not mentioned this to you to show off or anything, but I'm mentioning it so you, you can see. People are ungrateful, man. So when you do good for someone, don't expect them to say thank you. But just because they don't say thank you doesn't mean you shouldn't. The one of the worst things you could do is that someone's good to you, Allah, and you don't even approve, and you just clap back at them. Does that make sense? You clap back at them. Anyway, what happens? The next thing is to do righteous actions and to have iman. Allah says, فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَرِزْقٌ كَرِيمٌ Those who have iman and do righteous actions, Allah, He has for them forgiveness and what? رِزْقٌ كَرِيمٌ A noble rizq, a noble provision. Does that make sense? And also, do not make halal what Allah made haram. And don't make haram what Allah made halal. Allah says, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْ the adornment, the beauty of Allah Azza wa Jal, which He has produced for His servants, and the good, lawful things, the halal things that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made for you as risk, as provision. People now come and say this is haram. But some people are very easy with their battle. You know, every food that comes out, a guy says it's haram. A brother called me the other day. He said to me, "Akhi, is this haram?" I was baffled. Like he, I, it was as if he asked me. I can't remember what it was, but imagine someone comes and says, "Akhi, a chocolate muffin is haram." Like, you know that kind of thing. So, brother, relax. 
The same way you cannot make something halal, something haram halal, that music you can't say it's halal, you cannot make something halal haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الذي, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, جعل, جعل لكم ما في, ما في He's the one who made everything on earth for you. He gave it to you. Allah gave it to you. And he made this for you. Halal. And for you to say, no, no, it's haram. Who gave you the right to say that? Does that make sense? Who gave you the right to say that? So the same way saying something is halal, which is haram is bad. Something which is haram saying it's halal is bad. Does that make sense? But very quick. People got charts. There's this in the food. There's that in the food. There's this in the food. Where are you getting this from? I think I heard that a calf who walked by and he had bacon in his breath and he breathed and maybe it contaminated <laughs> the, you know, the, the KFC, uh, the halal KFC. You know what I'm saying? Like, just funny things people say, relax, bruv. You know, you know what you do to people like that? Well, lie, just eat it in front of his face. Just eat it in front of his face and say, I take a bite to him. <laughs> that was a bit rude. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's bad manners. I'm sorry, I'm in a bit of a bad mood today. I don't know if you guys can tell. <laughs> don't make things that are haram, halal either. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, a time will come when people will make zina, alcohol, the wearing of silk, i.e. for men, and music, halal. Allah will turn them into pigs and monkeys. Allah will turn them into pigs and monkeys. We'll make music halal. And now, how many people say music is halal? How many people say music is halal? Just a quick question. Um, is Nasif, are you allowed to listen to Nasif? Because some Muslims say you are. So there's a different opinion amongst the scholars. Okay. Firstly, the scholars who say you can listen to Nasheed, they place conditions. They say, number one, it cannot have anything filthy in there. Okay, it cannot have like the words, the lyrics, can't be bad. Like how, you know, for example, in songs, some people might listen, for example, uh, just music, which is a cappella, but the guy's talking about, you know, I bust two guns, I lick off two shots, you know, <laughs> I link two things, you know. The, the lyrics can't be bad, number one. <laughs> number two, <laughs> number two, number two, it can't resemble music. This is where a lot of nasheeds go wrong. He says, oh, it's just the voice, vocals, but does it sound like music? So it's not like music then. Did the Prophet Islam say cocaine is haram? No, alcohol is haram. So why is cocaine haram? Because it has the same effect as alcohol. The prophet said heroin is haram. No, but it's haram because it has the same effect as alcohol. So then, if something is similar to something, it takes the same ruling. And wallahi, a lot of these nasheeds, some of them you can't even tell the difference. Is it music or not? Some of them, okay, maybe you can tell the difference, but does it make you bop your head like you listen to music? Does it make you move and shake? Does it? Then this, this music. So that's the second condition. The third thing is that it cannot be something religious. Ooh. This is for the scholars who allow it. I'm talking about the scholars who allow nasheeds. They say it cannot be religious. It cannot be something that's ibadah. It can't be something that you get closer to Allah with. Why? Because every act of ibadah needs an evidence. And the Prophet never worshipped Allah through nasheeds. Some people do da'wah through nasheeds. They do what? Da'wah to Phoenix. Did the Prophet do da'wah? Yeah. Did Nasheeds exist at his time? Yeah, but people, people were just saying these existed. Did the Prophet do any of that? No. In fact, people say, oh, but there was poetry at the time and whatnot. Yeah, poetry is something different, Akhi. It's different. Poetry is different. It's a different thing. It's not Nasheed. Does that make sense? You're comparing apples and oranges. So then if the nasheed, so what kind of things would the sahaba do when they would do, you know, they would like recite things. For example, when they were in battle, they would recite things to build their morale, to warm them up. Like for example, you know what I'm saying? To keep their spirits up. Does that make sense? That's even if you say it's nasheed. We have to first prove that what the sahaba was doing was singing. We weren't even like that. Because some of the scholars who said nasheed is haram, they said because it's feminine. They said those high, high pitched vocals, that's not for the mandem. You're supposed to hit puberty many years ago, but you make your voice go, huh? <laughs> no lie. A guy's got, he's making his voice like that and he's saying, Allah. Get out of here, why do you sound like a female for? Okay, if you naturally have a low pitch voice, no problem. No one's gonna, there's no issue with that. But you make yourself like that. Come on, get out of here, 
So some scholars said it's not allowed for that reason, and some scholars also said because it's very close to music. And they said it's the actual, they, they say that what the, the, the nishis were invented by the Sufis, it was invented by people of bid'ah. So, they, so that's the argument of the scholars who say it's not allowed. I personally am very with the scholars who said it's not allowed. It's not allowed. Because what is something that is feminine, meant to be singing? Men don't sing like that. Men don't sing like that. You know what I'm saying? Now people do that with the Quran, by the way. It's disgusting. They what study what, um, like, you know how people say this, this thing is called maqamat? You know what they do? They go to a keyboard and they work out the pitches of the music, of the instrument. And based on that, they say it's the higher pitch, the low pitch. And they say, okay, now you're going to recite based on this. Well, like some of your favorite qaris today, they do this. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Does that make sense? So stay away from all of this. They've mixed the Quran and music. The Prophet didn't recite with maqamat. You don't need any of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Good tajweed, good clean tajweed, and the man knowing what he's reciting will get to the heart. Does that make sense? These are all innovations. Imam Bakr Abu Zayd wrote a kitab called Bid'atul Qurra, the innovation of the reciters. And he mentioned many things in there. So now men are what? Reciting Quran like he's what? Like he's an R&B artist. He was reciting thinking he's Justin Bieber. What are you doing? Don't come with that. Does that make sense? So these are very important things. So then yes, there, are two, there is difference of opinion. Scholars who said no, and that's the safest option. They said it's for women, it's not for men, number one. Number two, uh, no filthy lyrics, this, 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 whatever have you. It can't resemble music, it can't be worship. Now most of the people who do nasheeds, what do they do? They try to what? Make it worship. So it's a bid'ah. It's worse than a sin in that situation. And that's the scholars who allowed it. They said you can't do that stuff. Scholars of the Sunnah we're talking about. Yes, Akhi. What about the well-known maqam of Abdul Bash uh, Rosh? Well, I'll be honest, I don't really know the details of this maqam stuff. What I know is that generally the maqamat are bid'ah. They are generally bid'ah. The question is, we want to know the well-known recitation of Ibn Mas'ud. Like when we, recite, when we, when we learn the, the qira'at, how did Nafi' recite? How did what? Susi recite. How did Hafs recite? That's, that's what we learn it from. If there's no evidence for it, you know this is one of the miracles of the Quran, brothers. That the, the sounding of the words was preserved. The way you recite it. The way you recite it. So think about it. Akhi, this has to be recited with what? This, this way, this has to be recited this way. This has to be heavy, this has to be light, this has to be stretched, this can't be stretched. Precision. Precision. Does that make sense? Across the different qiraat in different ways. That shows you that the religion wants to focus and emphasize on the way it's being recited. And a guy comes and says, we're going to do a maqam, we're going to, we're going to go to this maqam here. Where's the delete for that? There's a good kitab called Bid'atul Qurra. We should go for it one day, inshallah ta'ala. Does that make sense? We should go for it one day. We should go for it one day. Inshallah then, um, so don't make things that up. We went off on topic. Don't make things that are haram. Halal. Don't make things that are halal. Haram from the risk that Allah has given you. The next thing, with regards to risk, Allah told you go out there and seek it. Allah said, فَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِ, في مناك بِهَا وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ وَإِلَيْهِ أَنْشُورِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to go into the earth, فَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِ بِهَا Go into the earth and eat from the risk that Allah has given to you. So seek the risk. Does that make sense? Pay attention, it's so important to go out there and seek risk. In Surah Al-Mudathir, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَآخَرُونَ يَضْرِبُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَبْتَغُونَ مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَآخَرُونَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Allah mentioned two groups of people. One that goes out into the earth, seeking money, seeking risk. Another that goes out into the earth, what? To do jihad in the path of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Umar ibn Khattab, when he commented this, he said, لِأَنْ أَمُوتْ He said, for me to die between my stock, my stuff that I sell, does that make sense? For me to die while I'm out on the earth, I'm hustling, I'm grinding, I'm trying to make money, halal, risk, uh, and trying to seek the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal and destroy the bounty of Allah is more beloved to me than being cured as a what? As a mujahidan fi sabilillah ta'ala. Why? He said, because قدم, قدم الذين يضربون في الأرض يبتغون من فضله على المجاهدين في قوله تعالى. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the ones who go out on the earth seeking risk before he mentioned those who are doing jihad. Does that make sense? 
So what? Mention what? Allah mentioned it first. Now this is not putting down the virtue of jihad. It's not putting down the great <coughs> virtue of jihad. We know the great virtue of jihad. We know it's one of the greatest acts of worship. And wallahu a'lam, I heard that there is a discussion of the authenticity of this narration. Irrespective, the fact that Allah mentioned going out there, seeking halal rizq, and then he mentioned jihad right next to it, it shows that it's something of great what? Virtue. All the prophets used to go out there and earn money. All the prophets used to work. Dawood used to do what? He used to work with steel. Nuh was a carpenter. Every single prophet used to go out there and earn his rizq. He used to go out there and work. And you have men that are sitting home bums. It makes me, it shocks me. I see an 18 year old brother, he's at uni, and you say to him, What do you want to do in life? He said, I don't know. He just spent 9K to study a degree and said, I don't know. Said, what do you mean you don't? What are you doing, Akhi? You should be providing right now. Well, I wait. It's, it's so. You should be hustling from age 14, 15. You should be thinking, how can I earn halal rizq? We need to build the youngsters to be like that. Because in this day and age, you need money, man, if you want to survive. And Allah tells you, go out there and seek it. If you seek it, I'm going to bring it to you. No problem. But go out there and seek it. So something very important, very virtuous. And by the way, one of the easiest ways to get to paradise is to be an honest businessman. There's so many narrations. There's so many narrations. To be an honest, easy-going businessman. Is one of the best ways to go to paradise. Many narrations and a hadith and the virtues that come with regards to this. Does that make sense? But some of us are happy working for Caro. Caro who comes on her menses and she doesn't clean herself. But we're happy working for Caro. Right? The risk that Allah gives is of two types. There's the risk that Allah gives. To everyone, the Muslims and the Kuffar, the animals. Does that make sense? For everyone. Then there's the risk that Allah gives for the believers. And that's Al Jannah. That's Jannah, that's Iman. That's the risk that counts. Knowledge, beneficial knowledge, Iman, <coughs> Tawfi, Paradise, Sunnah, guidance to the Sunnah, stay away from Bid'ah. Guidance to Tawheed, staying away from Shirk. This is a risk from Allah. This is the greatest risk. Does that make sense? It's only from the, it's only for the believers. Does that make sense? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, and this is the final words we're going to leave, inshallah ta'ala. Allah said, Ma indakum yanfad. Whatever you have in this world, whatever you have with you, whatever you earn, whatever you go out there, it will end. Whatever is with Allah, it will last. It will last what? Forever. Allah said, بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah said, no, but you prefer the worldly life. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى But the next life is better and it lasts forever. So based on that, my brothers and my sisters, do not become too preoccupied with your rizq. Searching for it too much to the point where you neglect the rights of your Lord Especially when you fall into haram And disregard the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu